5 4 3 2 1 we are live good evening friends greetings from devbhumi uttarakhand on behalf of uttaranchal orthopedic association and my own i welcome you all to the third symposium of this season the elbow symposium it is my privilege to introduce you to the speakers and panelists of today's symposium we have with us professor alok chandra agrawal hod orthopedics from aims raipur chatisgarh who will be tackling the com complex olecranon fractures today welcome you sir we have with us dr amit ajgaonka from mumbai the famous organizer of so many mumbai trauma cons and other specialty conferences such as nails con and others welcome you dr amit he will be dealing with terrible triad in elbow friends we have with us dr ajay gupta from agra the past secretary of aos and a very dynamic ortho surgeon from agra we have with us dr govind ji sethi from united kingdom who represents india in the uk for the past 20 years welcome dr govind sethi we have with us dr navneet badoni from dehradun he is a young dynamic surgeon previously he was with ssgr medical college dehradun welcome dr badoni and last but not the least we have with us the multi talented professor sudhir kumar of rachi he is master of trauma spine arthroscopy orthoplasty everything you name in orthopedics he is past president of jharkhand orthopedic association and a role model for the young ortho surgeons welcome dr sudhir now i would request professor alok chand to please share your screen and start the topic good evening sir i'll share my screen so the topic given to me is olecranon complex fractures Olecranon fractures, as you as you know, are very common injuries. You may get it by a sudden violent contraction of the biceps, and the trapezius is being pulled out, or you are directly falling on the elbow point, or you are hit onto it. So, depending on the trauma, the olecranon gets fractured, maybe extraarticular, maybe transverse, maybe oblique, maybe at the base, or at several places. and it is perhaps the simplest fracture which the orthopedic intern or house surgeons start to operate thinking that it is very simple but not everything is so simple and this is what how we'll start to get to know and it is not only the x-ray that we are treating but it is the patient the limb that has to be operated So I'll first show you some simple X-rays so that you understand that how common it is. So here you are seeing a fracture of the olecranon, which has got separated. The elbow is stable, and the tension and wearing has been done. Although the reduction is good, congruence is good. But if technically you speak, then both the wires are away from the tip of the olecranon. 
the wires are of unequal length and they are not crossing the coronament the fracture excuses you so many times forgives you because it unites but if the wires are there which have migrated and there is always a painful bursa there at the elbow you put the elbow and it pains the wires may come out getting loose with wounds or they may just come out as such leaving the reduction many times you will be getting a band which is digging beneath on your putter elbow and it has to be brought out so every surgery with a tension and wiring will require at least one more surgery if it is united and if it is not united it will require more surgeries now here you can see there is a fragment and there is another fragment in between of the articular surface and down so this means this is now getting complex it is difficult to be treated and so you will have to learn how to reduce it and how to fix it and we are having very good plates nowadays but this is the old x ray where you could see that a lag screw has been put to reduce the fragment achieve the interarticular alignment and then a recon plate has been used to keep the contour maintained and of course this also once you extend will be impinging into the olecranon fossa and there may be little extension remaining but the fracture has united group get another x ray and you can see that the fracture is there although articular congruity is there but it may have to be fixed and it has been fixed beautifully many times it so happens that the wires are going intermedullary into the ulna and then they become loose and migrate so having them perpendicular to the fracture getting engaged into the coronoid is the ideal way to put them yet another case you can see there is a fracture of the olecranon and being the simplest fracture it will be fixed in emergency by a beautiful tension band wiring and it will unite problems i have already told you another case olecranon fracture comminuted the fragments have been made to set although not fixed and the tension band has been applied the fracture unites get another case oblique fracture coming towards the base making the elbow unstable but then it has been treated by a tension band wiring and it is possible again you see a case again the same problem so there are so many cases and to keep on getting an olecranon fracture and most of the people where they cannot afford plates people devise their own ways to bring the fragments back into position and put a tension band and this one you can see it is complex but out of unavailability still many of the orthopedic surgeons will treat it with a tension band wiring only and usually with acceptable and good results so then we have to now discuss what is the actual art behind complex olecranon fractures or as such so one thing which is important is assessment of the fracture and soft tissues before you go for surgery because if it is open it is ragged it is abraded then there will be chances of infection a fracture usually represents a disruption of the triceps mechanism combined with a bending movement over the distal end of trochlea more direct forces generate comminution that is fragmentation and impaction of the central portion of the olecranon articular surface and occasionally avulsion of the coronoid process the skin becomes swollen at times contused or bruised and the lateral view clearly shows the fracture line the amount of displacement and usually the degree of comminution is present so good quality x rays without a slab are 
actually ideal to know whether it is simple or complex. You all must be knowing the simple classification, grade one, extra articular, grade two at the tip and grade three at the base. So that was a basic classification. But the Shaskar classification is the ideal classification where type is a transverse fracture. Type B is a transverse impacted fracture of the articular surface. Type C is an oblique fracture. Type D is a comminuted fracture. Type 5 is a distal comminuted fracture. And type 6 becomes a fracture dislocation. So you start with the transverse. And then the more you go towards B, C, D, E, and F, it becomes more and more complex. So how to operate on these fractures? But it is very simple to make the patient lie supine, but then you don't get a three-dimensional view. Sometimes the people keep the patient supine and support the limb so that they can go from the posterior approach. But most of the orthopedic surgeons keep their patients in a lateral position so that the elbow is hanging free on the prone position in which they have a three-dimensional access to the elbow joint. Coming to the incision, you have to make a posterior skin incision from the tip of the olecranon to an adequate distance distally to secure fixation. When you give the incision, one should not make superficial planes. You should cover the incision radial to the olecranon to avoid late wound dissens, and a minimally invasive approach is better under fluoroscopy. So ideally, you should keep an image intensifier ready with you. Simple fractures, it is okay. But once it comes to complex injuries, you should identify and isolate the alarm nerve. You should carefully debride the fracture edges, making sure to preserve the periosteum and soft tissue attachments to comminuted fragments. And that's why we said that a minimally invasive approach is better under CR rather than opening up all and making the fragments of vascular. So then how to get a reduction? Well, you can go for direct reduction technique using hooks pointed reduction wires or K wires. And this is the method of choice for articular fractures. And multi-fragmented fractures may require an indirect reduction technique. So here you can see one fragment, second fragment, third fragment. So you have brought it here under direct vision. You're holding the fragments with the pointed direction clamps, the passed a K wire. Then you will bring the next fragment. So this is how you go for reduction. Sometimes you can flex the elbow and detach some of the fibers of the anconius muscle from the lateral express so that the fracture and articular surface is open under vision. After irrigation and cleaning the joint, then you go for the reduction of the fracture. So what are the choice of implants? I told you and I showed you multiple cases that people like to do tension bend principle because it is cheap and simple. You can use two K wires of 1.8 or 1.6 millimeter as internal splints and a 1 mm stainless steel circlage wire, which can be used for transfers and oblique fractures. Here you get a direct reduction by extending the elbow and simultaneously reducing the fragments with a pointed reduction clamp. Anchoring its distal point on the diaphysis in a pretty little small hole. The method of choice is tension and fixation with two K wires. So what you have to do, make a hole, put your pointed direction clamp, flex the elbow, the fragment gets reduced, you pass two K wires, coming parallel to the fracture site into the coronoid and then go for application of the tension band. 
for oblique fractures prior to the tension band fixation, you can put an additional lag screw at a right angle to the fracture plane. For more distal fractures or those associated with soft tissue instability, a posterior plate is needed. So you get a reduction past the wire, past two wires which are important. You have to bend the wires so that you insert them. They should go deep and not away from the bone. And in oblique fractures, you can pass screw. So that keeps the fragment stable before putting the tension band. Now, if it is a complex fracture with multiple fragments. So in cases where a simple depressed fragment is visible, you reduce it directly and fix it with one or two K wires. You can put a regular tension band wire. But for more complex comminuted fractures, you can go for an indirect reduction. So you can get an indirect reduction by the help of traction, by the help of an articulated distraction zip, by the help of a plate and screws, and by pointed reduction clamps. So this is a fragment, and you can see a plate was put in the fragments, pulled to bring the reduction and a pointed reduction clamp brought the fragments together. The plate has been secured. But you have to practice these things. It is not so simple. When to do plate and screw fixation? Well, plate fixation has the advantage of maintaining fixation in fractures with communication, distal fractures, and complex fracture dislocations. Typically, a plate is used in a neutralization mode. It means you get a reduction to stabilize it, and above it for mobilization, you put the plate. The plating technique allows us for lag screw fixation of the olecranon, also of the coronoid, to anatomically reconstruct the proximal ulna. And now, if you all know about the synthesis plate, the newer pre contoured plates, which are of a low profile, they provide more screw options for the proximal segment. They have got locking screw capabilities. They contain a bend to match the proximal ulnar anatomy for extended fractures. It has been found by biomechanical testing that they provide significantly greater compression compared to tension band and they maintain it. They don't lose it with time. In the treatment of transverse olecranon fractures. Ideally, people don't reconstruct mantha tubular plates, DCPs, or recon plates as they don't serve the purpose. So here is the LCP olecranon locking plate. You can see the various combinations of screws which are possible into it. And some companies have come with the screws that are of different sizes, combi holes, compression screw, locking screws, thinner screws, holes for primary fixation, holes for tying the triceps. So they are giving so many things. So here again, you can see an oblique comminuted fracture at the base in a 41 year old patient. So the fractures has been reduced indirectly. All the fragments have been brought into position and the LCP has been put beautifully holding the fragments. And once you do it good, you can start early motion at the earliest. So let us see how do we go about the surgery. So as we discussed, the patient lies with the arm hanging, supported at the elbow. You give an incision, going radial side to the olecranon. You go straight deep without superficial dissection. You can identify the fracture. You can identify the ulna. You assess the distance beyond the coronoid process to make a drill hole here. You can see how beautifully soft tissue attachments of all the fragments have been preserved. At this juncture, you can take off slightly the lateral fibers 
of the anconius and wash away all the hematoma from the joint with saline wash. To go for minimal dissection, we are using thin woman retractors to take a pointed direction clamp into the hole that we have made and you hold the fragment into position. You can confirm this under fluoroscopy. Then you pass the wire straight, crossing the fracture site into the coronoid. Then again you go, take the another wire, you go parallel to the first wire and they should go parallel. You can confirm the position. Don't pass them too much anterior, they will injure the nerve. Even with the posterior surgery, you can get a risk drop. So be careful in your dissection. So the wires have been bent, cut, a loop has been passed and these bent ends are pushed inside the olecranon so that they don't impinge on the elbow movement. You make a knot and you can make it more tight if required by the AO loop technique. And that is the beautiful dissection, the beautiful closer, and the case is over. Now, these are some of the complications that I was telling you. That you make the hole at the whole coronoid level. You pass the wires too much oblique. You make the wires too much long and you can injure the radial nerve also. So everything is possible. First important thing to avoid this thing is take care of the elbow envelope, the soft tissues. Do your timing of surgery, not as an emergency, but once the inflammation edema subsides. However beautiful surgeon you are, try to check your position in the CRM image intense file. So then what went wrong here? CRM was not used. Anconius was not released for this case. Alnar was not identified. The drill hole was not distal to the coronoid. The wires were bent. But if they are put out, they will be protruding and the patient may develop neuroplexia. So my message will be for this lecture that polyclonal fractures are common fractures. Some people call it as a beginner's fracture as it is considered simple and usually it is the first year residents who operate it. Even in complex fractures, most of the people who have mastered it, they go for indirect reduction principles and tension and wiring. But then if you want to start early motion, there is a fracture dislocation. One should have the whole range of implants and instrumentation to mold the olecranon LCP to the bone. We should respect the soft tissues always. Thank you. So, Thank you, Professor Arlo. Can we, can we discuss? Uh, lecture is uh, open for discussion. Yes, discussion. Yeah. So that it should be fruitful. Yes, sir. Yeah. Hello. Uh, the yes, question please. is, what is the differentiation mark of the fracture when you will do a PVW where you will do a plate? Not according to the affording capacity of the patient, but uh, anatomy of the fracture. This is a wonderful question. And tension made varying goes only for a transverse fracture or an oblique fracture. Apart from that, if there's a communition, coronoid, fracture dislocation, you should ideally go for a plate. But then I told you, people have mastered tension management. And it is also based on their expertise. Many people, even having a plate, cannot put it properly. So that is the message I wanted to give. One more question. Um, 
in complex molecular non fractures where there is a subluxation or dislocation of the proximal radial nerve joint if there is a lateral complex lateral called complex in the sense if there is a radial head fracture or if there is a, how often would you treat the lateral injury this is a medial injury the olecranon so how will, how often would you treat and uh, how do you suspect lateral collateral ligament of the common extensor so is it not the topic of your lecture now coming yeah i know but then in complex olecranon topic i definitely we will discuss but during complex olecranon fractures also sometimes when doing a plating we need to tackle the lateral side is it is a variant of terrible pride of course it will come in my lecture also so how so often what happens you... is that once we ask the mode of trauma so what was the mode of trauma and we see right. clinically so we can suspect only but i have not any time try to manually handle the lateral side so go for an mri for simple olecranon fractures ideally one should suspect and he should go for an MRI. that is how i feel all right sir sir in continuation of dr ajbaba uh, bachan sir ki can uh, we uh, pre predict any uh, ligamentous injury pre operatively in simple two part uh, olecranon fracture because after fixing the olecranon with tvw sometimes we are seeing that elbow is unstable is still that is, is there it. any so once you do standard lateral views and ap views if you feel that any of the joints or articular surfaces are not congruous or the gap in some places is slightly more than 1 or 2 mm it has to be ligament injury usually no, a transverse after... fracture is always stable it is not involving the joint only so there is no question about it but apart from transverse and oblique if there is any fracture pattern it is likely to have a ligament injury associated only what they say is that is what i read there is a paper where they uh, studied the lateral view of the olecranon in complex uh, fractures where there is a lot of combination in a lateral view if you see that the olecranon is in uh, flexion that is the fragments are like this then it is quite a simple fracture and you may only plate the olecranon whereas if the fractures tends to be like this so they talk about a flexion type and an extension type So it's a it's a flex extension type of dislocation or a flexion type wherein you have to address the lateral side also. Whenever it's an extension type, you have to address the lateral side. If it is a flexion side, you may just go with the olecranon. You have to see the olecranon in the lateral view. It is always seen in the lateral view. Yeah. Now we will try to see in that view. Correct. Correct. In a sort of. Uh, Out of Montezia fracture. Yeah. The fracture and that. Yes, yes, yes. It's a bad Bardo's classification. Bardo's classification for a Montezia variant. Many times you get those injuries. You can get the uh, only the ulna fracture is more proximal also. It can be a it can be a segmental ulna fracture also. Then it goes into you, know, you have to do multiple things mm -hmm. of the ulna and address the lateral side of it. Doctor Sudhir, you wanted to. Yeah. Oh, what will you do? You prefer in a transverse fracture? Is it is uh, tension band wiring, or will you like to go for a plating also? Which is a preferred technique for you? I told you we always go for tension band wiring, but if you do a plating, it is having more compression that is there. But tension band wiring is ideal. Transverse fracture, a tension band wiring. What should be the length of the plate? What how much uh, should be the length of the plate? For a transverse fracture, uh, for any fracture, but so how much length will you like to go distal to the most distal part of the fracture? Three to four holes. Three to four. Think. Um, how often? How often do you revise the surgery in patients who are been operated by by the residents of your department? Never. But we'll have to take out the wires after three months or six months, or when the extension is incomplete, or one wire is migrating out, or there will be 
the small birds are coming there, but there is seed page coming out of the wires which have come out. So these are the common complications. Please, sir, you had asked this where when you do the, the plating and uh, transverse fractures, what will you do? I think he is absolutely right. Transverse fractures above the proximal to the coronoid, you do a PDW. And in the fractures which are beyond the coronoid, oblique or comminuted, then you have to do a plating up. But that doesn't remain an olecranon, no? it is proximal no. The complex olecranon. Amit sir, one question sir, in yeah. continuation of my one uh, previous question, in last week I did one case of simple looking uh, two part olecranon, I did TBW on table, after doing TBW the elbow was unstable, it was dislocated, so I uh, went towards the media side, so MCL was torn, uh, even after repairing the MCL the elbow was unstable, so what could be the probable reason for this? Sir? Must be a look when your MCL is gone. If you say the MCL was gone. Yes, sir. So the lateral complex is also weak. So the lateral complex has to be repaired. The lateral most of the times, if you have a bruise on the lateral side, it's a common extensor tendon rupture or a lateral collateral ligament injury. Though your X-ray is not showing a radial end fracture, there is a ligament. It was not. Side, yeah, there is a ligament injury on the opposite side. So the ligament injury should be tackled from both the sides. To keep the elbow stable. I inspected uh, lateral call, uh, side also, but the uh, LCL was looking okay. There was not any injury. Yeah, on the x ray, you will not. Intraoperatively, you will look for the instability. Intraoperative. Yeah. I'm saying intraoperatively, sir. Okay. And was there a coronoid? It, it was looking very simple. Was there a coronoid? Coronoid was intact, sir. Coronoid yeah. was intact, sir. That was surprising. Uh -huh. Coronoid it was intact. Too much of dissection on the sides, making it unstable. Because for transfer structure, we need not open. But did you do too much of dissection on both the sides? No, no, not at all, sir. I did simple TVW with a longitudinal incision. And after doing TVW, it was honest. It was uh, so, while I, I was examining the range of motion, it was looking unstable. But Puni, when you yes, have sir. a needle, needle uh, MCL injury, then yes. you have to suspect uh, some other injury also. After repairing uh, uh, MCL, I, I have inspected uh, all around, but uh, se kuch aisa ki joki it, it, part it. See, this is a varus type of a fracture. Generally, terrible triad may valgus injury. Hoti hai. This is a, probably a varus injury, wherein the okay. MCL is gone, molecular is gone, and the last to go is the lateral side, the lateral collateral. So, you need to maybe open the lateral side also once. But anyway, you have to do what you Sir, uska MCL repair kara, LCL side pe uska suture laga diya, precautionary, lekin lag nahi raha tha, aur lekin phir bhi wo unstable lag raha tha, to phir three weeks ka back slab diya hua hai. Back slab diya, transolecranon wire nahi dali? Wo to kar diya, TBW to kara hua hai. Transolecranon wire? Wo intraarticular wires nahi dali. Because an unstable, many I have seen many people put a transolecranon intra intramedullary wire. Or else you can put a uh, ex external fixator also to keep it uh, stabilized, you know, in a, in a re reduced one for position. You can add an external fixator. Sir, I don't have any experience with external fixator, so I put one, uh, uh, this uh, back slab only because I have one poor experience with transarticular wires, sir. It breaks, it migrates. It, you are not supposed to put transarticular, tra trans non intraarticular wires. But then, uh, if it is absolutely unstable, you don't have external fixator, you can't expect it to be stable in a slab. The posterior can, slab. Can, uh, can we put one transarticular wire in such situation? Trans olecranon, basically, in the top of it. It is okay, actually. Many, times, many people do it. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Uh, sir, one more first, you know. Can I come in? It? Yes, sir, yes. sir, please, sir. Yeah, yeah, small thing first, you know. I want to know when you put your circular wire, where do you want to put a circular wire? Anterior to the wire or anterior to the tricep? That's one thing. Otherwise, I think worth telling to people who are on the, you know, or as an audience, when putting a wire in the coronoid, we should drill it across, then try to drill it out, and then make a 
figure of uh, you know 180 degrees of bend and then push it in so that it goes into the opposite cortex. That's one thing. But coming to the wire, where should we wire be placed? Anterior to the two K wires or anterior to the triceps? Well, the answer is that you are not chipping away any of the muscles from the bones. So the wires will are put and you make a loop of it towards the skin and that is what you are tying. You can never put the virus without stripping the bone that will make it a vascular. I showed you with the photographs how I am putting the virus. Those two wires, if you put, you have to lightly dissect the triceps and you have to bury those wires beneath the muscle. Yeah. You should bury I'm not talking about that. No, I'm not talking about that. When you make a figure of eight, okay, one is the soft wire going anterior to your K wire. That's one thing. The other one is, I normally push it anterior to the triceps. Yeah, good. That is right, actually. We should do yeah, that. Exactly. Right? So, so, however, in the past, yeah. people used to put it anterior to the two K wires. Probably putting it anterior to the triceps no, no, to make it, it much is. more stable. So, the tension band effect is on the triceps, not the K wires. Exactly, exactly. So, that's why I want to highlight the tension band. The effect would be on beneath the triceps and immediately post op, you have to do flexion. If you do flexion immediate post op, then only the compression occurs at the fracture yeah, side. Because it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a dynamic, it's, it's a dynamic principle as a matter of fact. Right? Yeah. Because when you, so, so the only yeah. thing I want to tell people, you know, who are on the as an audience that you need to put the wire and tear to the triceps. So again, one thing is we have some problems uh, putting. Plates. We have been putting plates for a long time. We're putting uh, striker plates. But sometimes, has anybody of you come across, in spite of putting plates, the the olecranon fracture has been pulled apart? Follow up X-ray. Four weeks down the line, we find the olecranon fracture is off because, in spite, we have put a locking screw. We are putting a home screw as well. Uh, we do find that sometimes. Uh, in one or two cases, I've gone through a sad experience that the tricep has been pulled apart. The, the, the polycrine fracture has been pulled apart. I don't know what are the other people experience, but... Well, actually, what is happening in many times is that people are trying to bridge the olecranon fragment with the main fragment, but they don't take care of the cumulative small fragments in between. They are just put there by sutures as a bag of bone. These are the cases which come out. If you have gone for a proper reduction and holding the fragments with interflex screws and then apply a plate, they don't come out. That is what I was showing in my last X-ray also. No, but the problem is the fracture is so comminuted that you can't put lap screws. That's where in the situation like that, we had, we had the plate two cases. Is to be bridging the fragment. So this has to be sutures which are trying to hold the fragments and then you have to wait till it unites you don't start early movement otherwise they will just come out but then we are losing the <laughs> principle of fixation with it uh, i think so in such cases we... if you have a good fixation in the plate the proximal the proximal most fragment you have got a good screw and the head along the the screw which is transfers a head run screw or call it the long screw. And a good olecranon, uh, uh, basically a uh, fixation, olecranon and a coronoid fixation. Articular cartilage is maintained well, keeping in area, and the bare area. So I don't think, as Alok has said, there should be any problems in the plate. And you should stretch the periosteal sleeve and the muscles over the plate. Yeah, you right. keep the fragments by their pressure in position. You are not just putting a plate and then doing the skin closer. And the plating is much, much better and it's a very sturdy fixation. It's a very good fixation if done well. I would like to ask a question, sir. While putting the long screw from the plate, from the olecranon tip, so, uh, how does it hold when it is there in the uh, olecranon cavity only? 
it is there in the intramedullary uh, area only. Okay? It does not go. Yes, yes. So, so it's, how it's, does it's it? Uh, it actually it approximates the plate to the proximal olecranon. No, there are, you you might have seen post-operative X-rays where the plate is away from the bone many a times. No, for that you have to dissect it properly and put that screw very well. So, so, it so no, no, com no compression rule from. No, no you don't expect compression with that. Just preventing a toggling of the polyclonal fragment and keeping it into position by a buttress. I think more than that. That's a probably a home screw, isn't it? The home screw. Yeah. Home run screw, yeah. 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 We are coming up with a new thing, which is probably be reflected in some paper in the years to come. Uh, hospital is going on a soft trial. Soft trial is done for people more than 65 years of age. Uh, we do have to talk to the patient in which we don't use any K-wire. Uh, for a simple reason, osteoporotic bones, K-wire migrating. We have not come to a conclusion, but we give the choice to the patient. It's a soft tissue trial. If it works, you might get a paper in coming years or so. It's for elderly age group, soft tissue trial. There's a technique, how to suture the olecranon. Uh, I'm not sure how will it turn up, but we are going ahead with that plan. Not putting any implant, only suturing the soft tissue. Yeah, no implant. We have to randomize, we are doing it. It's for elderly age group, that's what we're doing it. Surprise, surprise, let me let you know. Any patient who is 70, 75 is above, elderly patients, we bring them to examination. If they can't do a fracture olecranon, if they can't, there's no subluxation of the x-ray, if they can do active extension, maybe power about four by five, we stopped operating on them with the tension band. So you keep them but in that's, extension? But, no, we, we see to them, we give them color and cuff sling, keep them in bit extension, but there is a limit to it. 75 years and above, can do active extension, power of three to four by five, elderly age group, no subluxation on a lateral view and an AP view. We are treating them non-operatively now. It may sound very different, but that's what we're doing it. Okay, I have a question. Uh, the two K wires which we pass in tension band, should they cross the opposite side of the ulna always? Or should they be intramedullary? Can they be intramedullary? I believe in opposite cortex to pierce through that. The migration is less in those cases. You can still get some migration. And that's why you, you drill opposite cortex, withdraw it, bend it, then hammer it again. How, much, how much do you pass and how much do you withdraw? How much do you pass, how much do you withdraw? I'll tell you one. Suppose on a lateral view, you've already drilled the opposite cortex. Take your drill very close to the soft tissue, right? As close as possible, okay? Because you're absolutely right, when you put a drill on the k bar, you don't know how much to withdraw. Now, take that drill right to the soft tissue where the tricep is, and try to push it out a bit so you know how much you've taken it out. Because that's the only way you can measure, okay? And also, once you've done it, I, or I have one or two instances when I found that while I'm doing supination and pronation, I find that the radial tuberosity, because the wires were big enough, the radial tuberosity, the patient was having a click. And if I had left it like that, you would have difficulty in supination pronation. So the wires are out, whatever is out, drill into the right to the bottom, withdraw it under the extra control, and then uh, bend it. That's how I do it. Okay, and one more question is, uh, how far, Alok had already told once, that um, you have to cross the olecranon. How far is your transfer sole for that wire to pass in the distal part of the bracket? How far? I, mean, I, I, uh, I normally, as a matter of fact, I don't have a calculation to it. I would normally go by about maybe one and one inch maximum, or maybe less than that, but not too far. But uh, but I don't know whether there are any papers about it. I'm not aware of it, but I want to make sure it's stable not very superficial to the you know the cortex that it cuts through i normally that's my first wire i put it before i put my k wires for that hole to make that hole do you drill it or do you just put a thick k wire and make a hole no i i always the first wire will be either i use a two millimeter drill you see and then put a k wire which is a soft wire which is 1.6 millimeter uh stainless steel wire I mean, sorry less than that 
1.6 is my K wires, and the soft wire is 1.2 or one millimeter. And figure of eight, you can put it. The other way of two doing is you put two windings, you know, on each side. There's no harm in putting like a tension band, a figure of eight. I tend to put one on each side of the wires, you know? Yeah. Uh, and then there's nothing wrong. Yeah, two loops. But there's nothing wrong in putting one loop. Absolutely not. Yeah. I don't so think it's much of difference. That was my further question. What is the advantage, if at all, with a double loop or a single loop? I, I don't think there's much of the advantage, to be honest. There's not. But people have shown it. What I'm saying is a practice, whether it makes good. I think it's good when the assistance is there. He does on one side, you do on the other side. Uh, and also, the only thing is, then you don't have to use your, what you call as a tension band wiring system. You can just use a normal pliers and try to pull it through and try to wind it on opposite side of each side. But there's nothing wrong in doing one loop. Absolutely the nothing to worry about. With a slack in the tension band. Yeah. So yeah. if you can see it, then you have to take it off the way you do it, but don't break or not or the loops. That is important. Remember, too much of tension also will crush the fracture site in osteopenic bone. So you have to close it and maintain the strength. I have a question, sir. Uh, without passing the K wires, can we have two holes, one in the proximal part of the you know, olecranon and uh, the second one in the distal part and we just uh, have the wire tightened along them? So we can have any of the things. You are saying the question is whether it is stable enough being an intra-articular fracture to give early motion. If you just want to keep the fragments together in a slab, maybe it will suffice. But it is, doesn't have the biomechanical strength required for function. Okay. One more thing interesting. Yeah. yeah. One more. Uh, what do you do? What do you do in a child who got a fracture all in about 12 years of age? Fracture all in it. Now, we, there's a problem with the epiphysis, still not fused, 10 years, 11 years, you see. What do you do in those cases? So this is a very tricky question, because you put a tension band and don't take it timely, the growth will be retarded. Sometimes you can just manage with two K wires, which you yeah. can pull out at six weeks. That yeah. is also there. Yeah, that's absolutely right. What I tend to do is I put some two smooth K wires, okay, smaller diameter. Rather than using a stainless steel, I put a fiber wire. Fiber wire size 3050, and because you don't have to take them off. And naturally, the problem is if you feel and then try to remove it up as soon as you feel the fracture united. But that's what we do. We do come across this fracture, uh, but we don't use a stainless steel circlage wire. We use a fiber wire, which doesn't need to be removed as soon as the, because then it doesn't need a big surgery, two stab incision onto the uh, under extra control, image into this bar, six to eight weeks down the line, pull the wires out. And this, uh, the fiber wire, which is uh, like something like strong ethibone, doesn't need to be removed and it works fine. Hello, Ashok, sir. Hello. Hello, one thing uh, regarding Hello. Dr. Suroi. Sir, uh, if uh, we have got enough discussion, we should... I think we should move, to proceed to the other one. One question, one question, Puneet. Uh, you know, yes, many sir. times, after we do the distal end of the humerus, and that olecranon osteotomy needs to be done on TBW. So, most of the times, what happens is, uh, the TBW fails. The distal humerus uh, plates are very good. But TBW is not done well. Now that is an intraarticular fracture which has been created by us. It's an iatrogenic intraarticular fracture. So, what do you think is the reason? Any, any, anyone has thought about it? That so many failures or backouts of the TBW. Is it just because that a saw is used and a fracture is created? I used to think about it always. Why did uh, this happen? This has happened in one of my case also. Yeah. But surprisingly... Sir, maybe, sir, maybe because of transfer of surgery or sometimes thickness of the blade. Because uh, creating 1.5 gap in the bone, that, that is creating bigger problems. Than, uh, this of the blade, heat of the blade, sharing forces at the fracture side, no impaction coming to the posture to me. 
And then you are not keeping the standard sizes of the wires. Yeah. And, and for the same reason, what they say is sometimes you learn into non-union as well. So to avoid this problem, what you can do is you can pre-drill before you do an osteotomy, avoiding tension band, you can pre-drill and then put a screw. That's one way of looking into it. Some people even tend to go ahead, use a small uh, olecton plates just to avoid this complication of causing a problem of non-union or failure of uh, tension band. So either pre-drill the hole, then do an osteotomy. You've got your screw where it should be. It will match the alignment where it should be and go through it. Or you put a small olecton plate. It was a very good discussion, actually, on Olecton Road. Amit, sir, you should start here. Yeah. Should I share the screen? Uh, Dr. Amit, uh, I would request you to please share your screen. Can you see it? Yes, sir. It's visible yeah. now. So the terrible triad. What's a terrible triad? We have been hearing this. And you know, in the one of the you know one of the conferences which I attended around five to six years back, people were telling me why discuss such terrible triads. Then uh, we do we just do a reduction and then. But terrible triad, a person, each and every orthopedic surgeon needs to know what it is and how it needs to be treated. It's an elbow dislocation with a coronoid or a radial and a radial head fracture. Generally, generally it is this way. And uh, I will talk about the stabilizers of the elbow. The anterior column, very Ajay. important, uh, wherein there is a coronoid process. Hello? Can you hear me? Anterior Alok, sir, please, please mute your Hello, sir, please. Anteriorly, you anteriorly, we have the stabilizers, which are the coronoid, the brachialis muscle, and the anterior capsule, which is very important. The laterally, we have the radial head, capitalum, lateral collateral ligament, which is the most important thing. Medially, we have the MCL, which is very important. The coronoid again and the medial epicondyle to some extent. Now, the posterior stabilizer is the olecranon itself, triceps muscle, and the posterior aspect of the capsule. It's generally a fall of the outstretched hand, axial load. Most of the times, it is a Valgus stress, valgus injury with supination. Ultimately, if it's a valgus and a supination injury, it's a posterior lateral rotatory instability. Why is it so terrible? It's extremely unstable. Loss of joint congruency, instability. Fracture fragments are usually quite small, difficult to repair. And just a plain X-ray will not show you all the fractures. You will have to go for some certain scans, CT or MRI. Patients don't routinely do well. That is very important. You have to understand that you are operating for elbow stability and not for mobility. And we are, and normally a surgeon or a patient is unaware of the magnitude of the injury for the elbow, the residual instability and the stiffness. Patients will never do very well even if you have operated. That's a lateral collateral ligament, which is very important. And amongst that, the ulnar lateral collateral ligament is the most important and not the radial or the ulnar uh, annular ligament. Amongst the medial collateral ligament, it is the this bundle that is the anterior bundle, which is very important because this is the bundle which is attached to the uh, coronoid, the sublime tubercle at the base of the coronoid. Proximally, you can see that there is the anterior capsule. This is the anterior capsule attachment. This is the brachialis and the anterior bundle of the MCL here on the sublime tubercle. So you need to know that in the olecranon, in the coronoid, you have got the anterior bundle. You have got the sublime tubercle at the base of the medial side where the MCL is attached. That's very important because sometimes if you have Medial injuries, MCL injuries, you have to look out for the sublime tubercle. So that's a coronoid, that's a terrible triad injury, wherein on the lateral side, you've got the common extensors, the LUCL and the annular ligament injuries. Or on the medial side, you've got the common flexors and the MUCL, that's the MCL. The medial muscular anatomy, one needs to know, and this is the common flexor origin from the medial epicondyle, 
pronator quadratus and all the flexor group of nerves the flexor group of muscles tendons you have to always remain below this below the pronator teres so that the only nerve that you get is the ulnar nerve of the section on the medial side you avoid all the uh, anterior and the anteromedial complexes on the lateral side you have these muscles and the nerves which you have to avoid as the radial nerve you have to remain below your ecrl in between your ecrl and edc or between your ecu and the enconius that's the uh, uh, capillans approach and the cockles approach so here uh, this is the i'll tell you this is the uh, normal approach that we use between the ecu and the enconius that's the cockles approach and uh, if you go there down you can uh, go down directly on your radial head normally you have you have this elbow if it's a stress or injury on the valgus side then what happens is the coronoid acts as a mechanical block trochlea hits on the coronoid capitulum hits on the radial head further valgus will tighten the mcl and ultimately the mcl is the last structure to fail in a valgus injury or a posterior lateral type of an injury how about a varus force whenever there is a varus force this is the lateral ligament complex and that's the last to break in a varus injury you have a coronoid fracture and you have a lcl fracture lcl injury so that's the mcl the anterior bundle which is very important and it is the last to fail in a valgus fracture and on the lateral side it is the lucl which fails last in a varus injury posterior dislocation and radial head posterior dislocation radial head and coronoid or all, all these are the these are the two variants of terrible triad if you have a trans olecranon fracture which we were discussing and which i was telling you in a complex olecranon injuries like this this was the thing which i wanted to mention that this is a posterior or an extension type of an injury which is not a good injury so you have to treat this fracture of the uh, olecranon and the proximal ulna as well as the lateral complex also in these type of injuries this is a posterior fracture dislocation this is an anti this is also a posterior fracture dislocation when you find the proximal radial ulna joint also uh, dislocated now in coronoid fractures uh, tip fractures are the most important fractures and these are commonly involved in uh, terrible triad whenever you have a terrible triad you have to look out for tip fractures and uh, it's not it's not needed that you treat the tip fracture always whenever you have to treat it use capsular attachment for buttressing or you can use a acl guide you can use heavy sutures either medially or lateral approach any approaches or a big long posterior approach is fine so here you reduce your uh, tip of the tip fracture and uh, you use a acl jig you can see over here and you pass your sutures and get your anterior uh, capsule also down and suture it over here this is the way you do uh, uh, a repair of your coronoid if your coronoid is too small it's just a small tip then you have to repair the anterior bundle or the anterior capsule which is attached there and that is very easy to do when your radial head is fractured from the lateral side before you fix your radial head you go down on the medial side from the lateral approach fix your uh, either your coronoid or your anterior bundle anterior bundle of the capsule and after you doing that get a stable elbow and then do your lateral uh, bony repair as well as your lateral uh, the ligament repair that's how you do it this is the anterior capsular repair along with the bone uh, repair if at all you do you uh, want to just put two screws then you have to go down on from the medial side if it's a large coronoid so before fixing from the lateral side you this is a of intraoperative picture where there is a radial head fracture and the fractured radial head once you put your uh, your retractor on medial side you will see the coronoid and once you see the coronoid you go down you fix the coronoid or the anterior capsule and then you go come back and do your radial head fixation how do you decide to put a plate on the radial head this is it you use the safe zone the safe zone is the extension of line 
from the radial styloid, radial styloid and the Lister's tubercle. So that zone is the safe zone. And most often a 2 mm plate will fit in over there. So I'll show you this it is a 34 year old female wherein there was a radial head injury and uh, this was a plate fitted over there from the lateral side and this is what has happened. Now this will cause, uh, this is a straight plate fitted, the plate is not contoured. If the plate is not contoured, this will be overfilling of the notch, the sigmoid notch over here because your radial head will completely shift over there. So this was fitted like this along with the suturing of the lateral collateral and the common extensor origin. Ideally, ideally, whenever you're doing a radial head fixation, you have to contour your plate. Nowadays, you get well-contoured plates, anatomical plates. But before, these were the days when only uh, we used to use a hand uh, set of the synthes, which wherein you don't have those radial head uh, contoured plates. If you contour your plate to this and then fix it, it would be better. How to decide what to do if replacement? Now, whenever you have a radial uh, terrible triad and you know that it's a terrible triad, you can never do a radial head excision. You have to either repair your radial head after fixing the, uh, fixing the medial side or replace the radial head. So you, when, how do you do a replacement? A close inspection of the capitalum, match your radial head to the coronoid and the sigmoid notch to avoid overstuffing, which I told you. Whenever you use a straight plate, you overstuff the sigmoid notch and you have to see that the width of the capitalum is proper. Allo humeral joint space should be congruous. If you are in doubt, don't use a bigger head. You may go for a slightly smaller head. That is enough because you have to fill in that void and the gap at the radiocapitular junction for the ligaments to heal around. The range of movements and stability testing should be done after repairing your LUCL and the secondary stabilizers. This is a 66-year-old male and typically this location you can see those small fragments, this, this was the coronoid and these small fractures over here and uh, you have to doubt that this is a terrible triad and uh, go down. The, this was the way we did. It was before repairing the radial head. This, uh, this suture was, this was passed, the needle and sutures were got down, anterior capsule was repaired. After doing that, a radial head replacement was done. After doing the radial head replacement, suture anchors used for the lateral ligament complex and the common extensor. It is generally a common extensor origin rupture most of the time. So you have to take care of both the lateral LUCL and the common extensors. This was uh, another case. This was a, a variant of the terrible triad. Here we did uh, we did this on uh, olecranon plate complex olecranon injury. And in this case, what we did, this was a different case where we did a radial head excision along with a repair of the medial side and the lateral side. Both the medial and lateral ligaments were repaired. And this patient somehow he did very well after we, because it was a very badly combinated and some of we had not planned, I'll tell you frankly, for a radial head replacement. So we repaired on the medial side, we repaired on the lateral side and just did this plating. Patient did well. Now these anteromedial fractures of the, or the of the coronoid are a bit tricky. So how to fix those? These are commonly seen in virus injuries. In virus injuries, you have bigger size of the coronoid which is fractured, and the the fracture comes more to the anteromedial side near the sublime tubercle. So what you do need to do is go from the medial side also. The medial coronoid has been approached is approached to the floor of the ulnar nerve. First dissect the ulnar nerve and then go through the floor of the ulnar nerve between the two heads of the flexor carpi ulnaris. So you have to dissect the flexor carpi ulnaris, the whole of your flexors along with the uh, flexor carpi ulnaris, one head goes up and the other head on the ulnar, uh, ulnar remains down and you approach from the, the medial side. So a plate can be fixed, a small plate or cannulated cancellous screws using a ACL guide. Lateral collateral repair is a must, even if you have done a medial repair. Lateral side has to be approached. You have to see most of the times it's a common extensor and which has to be repaired by suture anchors. So this is the way you, this is a long fragment, a big fragment, a large coronoid 
which is uh, fixed by a small plate and uh, olecranon plate also. And this is the way this red thing is the ulnar. Uh, now you follow the ulnar now on the medial side, the two heads of the flexor carpi ulnaris and the upper head, everything is retracted up along with all the, pro, uh, the pronators and the flexors. And there you land up on the medial side of the coronoid. And this whole thing is retracted up. Look the way it is retracted up and you see, see the large coronoid over there. Once you see that, Either uh, I have never done this type of a plating, but this is just a picture. But uh, you can approach the coronoid very well if it's a large fragment, and you can do a small. You can put a small plate, or you can put a screw from there. It's not difficult. It's in fact easy. So that's the medial repair. This is the way you do. You stick to the bone, and you have to just so you have to stick to the bone, and uh, it's a direct sharp dissection from the bone and go down on the anterior bundle of the MCL. This is the way you do it. You find the proxy. This is a common flexor origin along with the medial epicondyle. Now the coronoid fracture approach, or the, it's a posterior approach is quite extensile. If you have, if you want to do an extensile approach, you can approach both the medial and lateral side from a long posterior approach. You can go down and dissect all the structures on the medial and uh, if you are not very familiar with the medial lateral approaches, you can dissect all structures this way and you can land up both medially as well as the laterally and uh, in that way you can get uh, access to both the sides of the elbow. That's a long approach, a posterior approach. This is uh, another terrible triad injury wherein a CT was done. A CT needs to be done. If you are in doubt, you can go in and do a, a MRI also for your ligaments. Well, that's the CT scan which is showing the coronoid fracture injuries and we went down, we repaired the radial head and the suture anchors were, were put for the lateral ligament complex. Radial head was repaired. The anterior capsule was also repaired. This uh, patient was a, a director general of police from uh, Chhattisgarh and uh, there, uh, this is a post-operative and follow-up patient. This is another case wherein uh, this is a, a variant of terrible triad. This is an elbow dislocation and a radial head with a sharp fracture. I told you this fits into the Bados classification. And uh, we did, I did the MRI for this case. And the MRI showed there's a fracture of the coronoid and a partial tear of the common extensor. So coronoid fracture, look, it was not very uh, easily seen over here. Though now retrospectively, we thought that this small could be a coronoid. So this helped us in uh, planning our uh, incisions. What we did is we did, we went down from the lateral side first. We uh, fixed the anterior capsule. We fixed the, we put a plate on the, uh, this ulna over here. And then we went on the lateral side and put this, did this radial head. Look how we have bent, we have contoured the radial plate. We went down on the lateral side. This was a suture on the medial side. And uh, though 15 months later, look what happens. The, there is a gap nonunion in the radial head. But the radial head has served its purpose of treating your ligament, ligament laxity and the ligament sutured. So radial head gets you a stable elbow, wherein the mobility might be less, but the elbow is stable. At this juncture, after year and a half, you might go down and remove your radial plate and do a radial head excision. So now your purpose of the radial head lying over there or a replaced head is served. The elbow is stable. Mobility is slightly less. You may get, you will always get an extension lag, but then your purpose is served. Here the uh, radial head had gone into the non-union. Summarizing. The terrible triad is an osteoligamentous injury. It is just not a bony injury. Fracture pattern depicts the mode of injury. Stability of the elbow has to be given prime importance and not the mobility. Elbow being a three-dimensional structure, a CT would add more to the treatment. Coronoid, if small, needs to be fixed from the lateral side before fixing the radial head. A large coronoid with an anteromedial extension, as I told you, fixed from the medial side. Posterior approach is convenient for the basal and the olecranon extension type of fractures. Whenever there is an extension into the olecranon, like uh, Alok has already talked about, then you go down from the posterior side, a long posterior approach, 
a radial head in a terrible triad always has to be either fixed or repaired ligament reconstruction is a must thank you thank you thank you dr amit for nice representation of uh, amit uh, how do you yes, how you are putting suture in the anterior capsule anterior capsule it's suture is quite easy from jaso no 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 i just i just made a drill look what happens is most of the times i don't have the acl jig so now i have purchased the acl jig with the acl jig it's very simple you can direct your uh, you can direct your cave as from uh, posteriorly to where your jig is there you, you have holes in that jig you can direct it otherwise i used to put a finger a small my finger on the toroid and then pass uh, a cave wire very slowly the tip of the cave wire used to touch my glove i used to feel it and there you know i used to then pass a straight needle with a hole get a suture down after fixing that like the way we do the ranavat we first take sutures in the anterior capsule get it down from two ends and then tie a knot on the posterior oh, sir, sir, how do you, you how do you have to yeah what is your rehabilitation protocol for such terrible triad injury for such a terrible triad look once it's a very bad terrible triad i i know that i need a stable a stable elbow and not a mobile elbow so i first once if i know that i've done my fixation proper three weeks of rest three weeks in a uh, in a split after three weeks i first start my flexion once the flexion is started first because flex it is very difficult to achieve and flexion is the most important thing for any patient extension lag can be tackled or the patient can accept it but flexion is very important for it to be and do all that so first the flexion and then slowly extension in a in a in a splint with a, you know you have those uh, uh, splints where there is guarded you can have angles where an inch restricted movement is there what it's called an angle oh, hinge, hinge fixator sometime fixator is required if at all my uh, reduction of the joint is not is the joint does not is not stable post operatively after fixing all the ligaments after fixing all ligaments and all the bones like we talked about it earlier if the joint is still dislocatable then i would put a fixator doctor amit yeah many times after elbow surgery to find that the swelling is persisting although it moves but not a full range it is painful so what do you feel about is the ligament repair not proper ligament repair not proper we will have those varus valgus instability if uh, varus valgus stable uh, both the sides it's stable then the uh, painful elbow could be because of a certain other uh, things like uh, osseous calcification can be there or you can uh, suspect a non unions in your fracture but most of the times when you have done a good fixation when you put a good good kind of good ligament repair the pain has to go yes alok that is the swelling usually remains long time edema swelling will be to some extent look it is i always tell my patients one year you have to wait for one year after that you will get your swelling will reduce your uh, movements will improve but there will be a extension lag extension lag is always there and they have to accept it. one year is the standard so, a stable elbow is much better than a mobile elbow which is unstable so one year people uh, accept it any any injury i tell always that it is one year don't ask me questions there will be swelling there will be even even your knee or a hip fractures there is swelling so they have to accept it in fact they are mentally prepared for it after operating you tell them sir is they are putting uh, when you are putting radial head processes are you using cement or on it's uncemented for radial head process the times most of the times are cement nowadays you get good processes nowadays uh, there are a lot of companies which have come up with good radial head processes in mumbai we have the uma surgicals and uh, you know some important processes also there 
the problem girl, I mean, one thing is there, when you got a terrible trial, I think very interesting talk. Congratulations for that. I mean, if you have reduced your elbow, okay, and the elbow is still swollen, what is the right time to operate? Would you jump in straight away or let the swelling go down a bit? For elbows, uh, I have never thought either that we have discussed about this, that uh, like in proximal tibia, we wait for around for the swelling to go. In elbows, uh, I would, unless and until it's a very bad elbow with a lot of blisters and compartment syndrome around, I would uh, go in and operate if there is a slight swelling. I think you send the right message. You know, I remember a patient. I'm not somebody who would replace a radiant head because because I'm not used to doing it. But it's an excellent thing. You need to do it. I remember a scenario with two children next to a patient with a fracture all the and and uh, I had to do it. But I left the radial head. Uh, surprise, surprise! It did well uh, rather than excising it. But uh, I should have replaced it. But I don't have. Uh, enough in uh, what is the experience of doing it, so I left it rather than causing an overstepped, uh, you know, gradle head. But uh, that yeah. had helped to be honest. And the message goes wide and clear replace it, leave it if you can't fix it, uh, rather than jumping in to it, trying to do zero. Yeah. Yeah. That's true. I, I always try to either fix my first option is fixing the radial head, no matter how complicated it is. Even two or three parts of the radial head have come out on table. I have put in screws first on table the radial head and then fix it, put the plate and put it inside back. So these things are done. It depends upon your experience how you tackle the radial head and uh, the availability of good plates. It can go into non-union as I said, but that has to that can be accepted uh, provided your lay, uh, elbow is uh, stable and uh, later on you can do an extension. You're absolutely right because I cannot forgive myself for a case which I did soon after I got my master's MS, you know, and I feel I have done more harm to that patient. Exercising radial head, I will never forgive myself. But I have done that mistake and I've burned my hands right. and never do it again. Yeah. yeah, sometimes a lot of times we learn from mistakes. So if if at all you feel like excision, like uh, Dr. Tanna, Tanna sir always talks about excision of the radial head, no matter how bad it is. But whenever you are doing it, he talks about stability of on both the sides. You have to go down and prepare the medial side also. Because radial head is on the lateral side. If you are making the lateral side loose, the medial side also has to be tightened. Both the sides have to be tightened and prepared properly. But yet, it is never described in books. It is always talked about either replacing or repairing the radial head in terrible trial. I mean, these are the things when we didn't know about, you know, radial head and radial head fixation. And you rightly said about Dr. Tanna, because at that time, you know, we used to talk about primary stabilizer, secondary stabilizer, and that radial head being a primary stabilizer, we should to take them off. And we never used to repair the other stabilizer, collateral ligament. This will all come with bony anchors, which have come to our armamentarium and made life easy. But I, yeah. that is how I picked up and excited the radial head. Uh, but that was a mistake, I know. Yeah. Look, now the teaching for radial head has now come up in the last four or five years, probably, when we have understood the radial head and the ligaments very well. There were a lot of papers in the last 10 years which have come up on radial head fractures and the ligament injury, after which we, we became much more wiser and we have been treating them well. Yes. And I would also say, you know, if you're not comfortable, best is leave it to the people who can do it rather than doing it. And that is another thing I would let people know, you know, you don't have to do it because you want to do it, but do it first time right. If you can't, give it to somebody else who does it. And that's what I do. If I get a patient like that, I don't do myself. I leave it to other people who are better than me. But then, always it's a first time. I have also, I, I never felt that I am good enough. I have operated with friends who are, uh, who have joined as our colleagues and they have orthopedic surgeons. So, and to make a team, you operate it first time, read your, you read your topic well, your approach is well, and it is done. You do a very good job when you concentrate on your job after reading it and attending such meetings, of course. 
Amit, suppose you fix excise the radial head, you get an SX low price chain. What do you do to the wrist for the pain there? This is a very common thing because uh, even after doing, a, as I said, replacing, if you put a smaller head, then also there is a proximal shift of the radial head. And you can get a ASX lopresti type of a type of an injury pattern or uh, at the distal radial nerve joint also you have problems. But then in such cases, you have to see to it that you avoid these cases. because And then you uh, do not keep those gaps in the radio, radio capital. I didn't understand why and when you get this ASX lopresti in a terrible track. It's only if you do not fix the radial head and if you're, there's a void in the radio, radio capital and column, you get a shift of the proximal shift of the radio, radius. Then only you will get these SX lopresti. The treatment will be change it and get the length. Yeah. Most of the time when we are fixing the holicronon, holicronon plate, I have seen there is posterior prominence of the plate. Despite intraoperatively, we are seeing that it is properly fitted. But yeah. after uh, post op, you see the slight prominence. How we can avoid it? It's very difficult. At least that proximal end you have to bury between the uh, triceps if possible. Otherwise, it's very difficult. And use uh, properly put your screws so that the screws are not uh, projecting outwards and are not uh, prominent. Otherwise, uh, you your plate is uh, subcutaneous only many a time. But one end we are speaking, save the periosteum. Save the muscles, yeah. save the vascularity. At the other point, we want the plate to be covered. That is not possible. It is just beneath the skin. It is prominent. And also the bad looking x ray, it doesn't look, it is not bad. If the plate never sits onto the holocrinic, it will always be slightly proud, but because yeah. of soft tissue, and that is accepted to be a normal. Don't think the plate is off. It's still on. Yeah, yeah. yeah. All right. I think it was a very nice discussion. Yeah, right. Puneet. Puneet, to stop again. here now. Any other thing? Just want to ask something. Pardon? Sudhir, sir, are you there? Sudhir, sir, Ajay, sir, do you like to ask something? Dr. Sudhir, I think it's uh, it's nine thirty. I think we should wind up. Here. Yeah. Yes, yeah, it was a nice discussion. I would request it Dr. Sudhir very... to give a vote of thanks to the speakers and our panelists. It was it was really very nice discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks yeah. to Alok sir. Thanks to Am Thank you, Puneet. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, sir. 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 Thank you, sir.